Good morning, everyone. If I saw some of you on your way in and I was running that way, I'll say, uh, have you ever had that dream where you are gonna give some remarks and you open up whatever you have and it's completely different? Oh, uh, maybe that's just me. <laughs> no, but that's what happened. And I realized, fortunately, my office is right next door. So I am back and only slightly out of breath. I'll try not to pop that mic too much. They're always, you either need to be close or away. Is that a good? Thank you, perfect. So I am delighted to see so many of you here and I know we're gonna have people coming in. When I went to my office, I saw there was an event that was still going with a lot of people. So I wouldn't be surprised if we don't have a, fl a flood of people who come in. I'll, um, I'll vamp a little just in case that might help make sure that they don't interrupt this amazing panel that we have. So to me, the faculty lectures that we're able to have during reunion weekend are one of the most special parts. And having run into a few of you this morning in passing, I know that you've been looking forward to this too. When I think of what it is that makes Reed distinctive and special, I'll think about our faculty. We get brilliant, amazing, talented, world-class faculty here at Reed. And guess what they attract? Brilliant, amazing, incredible students. And you all, as alumni, experience that and, um, and so today we have, we have um, the privilege of getting to uh, hear from a group of people who are passionate about supporting students, who understand where we are here in Portland, who understand where we are in the world. Uh, and so I um, am delighted to be able to introduce them and in particular to introduce our uh, um, remarkable, extraordinary, faculty member, Professor Jerry Andrzejczyk. <laughs> Jerry is someone who stands out in the ways that she creates opportunities for her students to see how their art can have a positive impact on our community outside of this read, we call it sometimes the read bubble, um, and yet we do exist in, an, in, in, in the world and this is important to keep in mind. The exhibition she's going to discuss today demonstrates how we can create a global impact and it includes collaboration with former students, two of whom are with us today and also we'll be hearing from one of our uh, um, also wonderful um, faculty members, Barb um, Tenenbaum. So um, there'll be more introductions coming but for the formal introduction of Jerry, I want to note that Geraldine Andrzejczyk is a professor of art and artist at Reed College. She received her BFA from Carnegie Mellon University and an MFA from the University of Washington. For the last 30 years, she has created architectural installations and artist books based on medical and genetic information to explore personal and political issues. Each piece results from a lengthy collaboration with scientists and medical researchers with the goal of producing work that incorporates and comments on medicine, genetics, and ethics. Jerry has had more than 50 solo exhibitions internationally and is the recipient of multiple grants and residencies. So thank you once again for being here this morning and please join me in welcoming Jerry. Thank you, Audrey, and it's so nice to see so many of you here today. Um, it's been a privilege to teach at Reed for the last 29 years. As an artist, I've worked uh, with and grown up with the students from every discipline, and in many cases, I continue to collaborate with so many of them. And uh, many of them that were in the exhibition, I've been in a lifelong conversation with them. Uh, the first of which I want to introduce is Jane Chin Davidson, one of my earlier students. And Jane is an art historian who ran the symposium in Venice after the, during the exhibition, Transitions and Transformations. Jane is a professor of art, history, global cultures, and, diverse, and the diversity and equity and inclusion fellow for the faculty development at the California State University, San Bernardino. She's a researcher and curator of eco-feminist art, eco-performance, and Chinese identity. Her third book, Companion to Contemporary Art in, global, in the Global Framework, co-edited with Amelia Jones, will be out this year. 
Jane received her PhD from the University of Manchester and her BA in art history from Reed College. And Barb Tettenbaum, my colleague, creates printed books, installations, animations, exploring the relationship between text, object, and the reader. Since 1979, she's published small editions of artist books under the imprint Triangular Press. She's devoted her career to teaching both traditional craft and contemporary theory around the artist book at or the Oregon College of Art and Craft and currently at Reed College. And Neely Yosha, also here, uh, a Reed grad, a Reed student, <laughs> is the founder and artistic director of Outside the Frame. Born in Tel Aviv, Neely Yosha is the daughter of indie filmmakers who made Israel's first anti-war film, Shalom, The Wayfarer's Prayer. Nilly started a filmmaking program for the homeless youth, for homeless youth in Oregon in 2009 that grew to become a standalone organization in 2015. Outside the Frame has become a household name for youth and empowerment in Portland, Oregon. And I want to welcome and thank all of them for coming with me today. Um, so what I want to do is give a little story of how we ended up having a show at the European Cultural Center and who was in the show and why I put it together in the way that I did. Um, in the spring of 2021, as the pandemic is raging, I was contacted by the European Cultural Center to represent Reed College during the 59th Venice Biennale. And the exhibition's title was Personal Structures. I met with the call, the curator for colleges and university projects, Lucia Pendra, and I proposed to her, rather than showing my own work alone, since it was colleges and universities and I was to represent something, could I please do an exhibition of alums and those who I've done research with over the years. Given that it was a pandemic, I really thought a lot about the artists and thinkers that I've been associated with who were working on really big global issues, many of whom have started independent organizations. So I put together this exhibition called Transitions and Transformations, the Constant Flux of Our Personal Structures. This is the Palace Bambao where the exhibition was held and it was on the second floor, uh, the right side windows, is the, <laughs> the room that we were in. Yes. Um, it was a small space, but um, we packed it full. Um, the exhibition uh, was really to focus on the internal um, personal structures that are in flux at this moment and take an empathetic look at our genetic and psychological realities. Um, the show was put into three categories, biological factors, which concern issues of genetics and epigenetics on our physical and psychological selves, environmental factors, work showing the effects of climate change on the landscape and human livelihoods, and social political factors, works documenting and responding to forced migration, indigenous identity, and homelessness. And Barb and um, Nelly will be addressing that pretty directly today. So my work was in the exhibition as well as others, um, and I'll talk a little bit about the, the work that I did with uh, Dr. Shizuko uh, Amai Tasahaki, and she is a medical uh, doctor and bioethicist in Tokyo. So I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, the show was fabulous and very fun, of course. Uh, this is Ethan, Raphael, and Nilly and I in Venice. We went to the opening. Um, and during the pandemic, I was in touch with many of the artists, as I said. And what I said to Nilly the other day about her work stands for much of many of the artists. Each of these artists and art organizers engage in social and political issues in a very deep way. In Nilly's case, as well as others, they, have so, they are social practice artists that give agencies to others. They make space for others to see and create, and they, in turn, will make space for others in their future. The arc of empathy and desire to alert people to what's going on in the world is what I admire in Nilly's work and others' work that were in this exhibition. We learned from the best. <laughs> um, so I also wanted to let you know that the um, exhibition was given the first place award for university and research projects from the ECC, 
and it was for, um, I will read Lucia's statement during the award ceremony. We watched it virtually, I couldn't go. Um, for sharing with us and our audience a beautiful selection of works made with and by those in transition or showing the effects of transformations of biological, environmental, or social political factors, bringing these urgent subjects to public conversation. So that really also came out of the symposium that we were able to put together. And as I also wanted to mention, we had great fun. And Millie's sister came from Israel to the exhibition, and it was joyous. Um, the work that I chose to show in this exhibition, I did in collaboration with Shizuko Amai Tasaki. And as I mentioned, she is a uh, doctor of um, genetics and um, a bioethicist. Shizuko was actually my first student at Reed College 30 years ago. She did a degree in biology in, focused in genetics and then stayed for an extra year to do a degree in art and a thesis with me. And in 2018, she appeared at my office door and asked me, with her three children, her mother and her husband, <laughs> <laughs> and asked me if we could do a book together. So we've been working on a book called Becoming You for the last two years. The pandemic has shut it down. I don't know when and if we'll ever be able to finish it because it went through a lot of transitions. But it's been this wonderful uh, project and one of the double page spreads is the first 100 hours and just the panels, the silk panels here show the most important stages of human development to gastralization, which is when all of your genetic mapping and your epigenetics is mapped. So, or the beginnings of your epigenetics is mapped. So this is a really important time in the development of a human being. Uh, the rest of the book carries on to be about genetic selection. The, the book is 100 pages, and there was also a film, and this is one of my favorite moments of my artistic career in which a woman is explaining to her son what he's looking at in Russian at the exhibition. <laughs> so, like, these are the moments you actually remember, <laughs> not how hard it was to make the work. Um, it was wonderful working with the team in Venice. We did everything virtually, and this is what the exhibition looked like. They built cases for all of the artists' books, and I focused on artists' books not only because I love and value them, but it's also a perfect vehicle for social political activist type work, and it was a way for me to be able to afford to ship a lot of work to Venice, Italy, and not spend, it, I, of course, it cost a lot of money, but. <laughs> Uh, and I should say, I got a lot of support from many people. But this is how this exhibition ended up looking. And I'm just going to take you on a tour. And as I mentioned, each of the sections of the exhibition was in different uh, bi the biological structures is the first. And this is Greta Ferweiler's work, who graduated in 2019. 2019 was one of Barb's students. And this is a beautiful book that unfolds to be a blanket. And uh, what the reason I thought this was so important is epigenetically, we're mapped from an early age, uh, given how much attention and care we are given as babies, and we're able to also be empathetic. So this is a really important epigenetic factor. Uh, another Do you know what that term mapped means? Mapped. Yeah, what does mapped mean in an epigenetic context? Well, you are affected, and your genetics will change, actually depending upon how you're affected by certain things. Most obviously, if you have a lot of pollutants around you as a child, mm -hmm. you will have, your markers will be raised. Okay, I, I know what epigenetic is, I just hadn't heard, heard the term map used in context. Mm, okay. Thank you. This is the work of M. Pearl, and he is a photographer exploring his transgender body and identity. Uh, his practice asks questions. What if the depiction of transgender identity could be met with empathy instead of object objectification? And this is a series called Metamorphosis 1 to 5, and these are photograph transfers on uh, Arches cover paper, and where they cracked, there's gold leaf. Also a recent grad. Um, environmental factors was really important section of this exhibition, and this is the work of Ethan Raphael uh, called um, Cheatgrass and the End, and it's a series of photographs transferred onto Arches paper into a book, 
Um, and just the magnitude of climate change that's going on right now, it felt very important to include that because of course, climate change is affecting every organism, including ourselves on the planet. Um, so this is an anti-Western photographed at the twilight of climate fallout. The evening pink was created in landscapes severely affected by fire, fire drought, the disruption of seasons, and the total breakdown of ecosystems. So this is um, his book that was in the cases. The exhibition was in two sections, two sessions. So the first went from uh, April through July, and the second July through November, because we had so many books, so we had to change it in the middle. So um, the other group that I invited into this exhibition were not my students, but uh, an organization called Emergent Art at Space. I worked with Grazia Paduzzi, and she's become a very close friend since 2012, and I'm on the board of Emergent Art at Space. This was started by her and her husband, Norman Packard, who's a, a graduate of Reed College, I believe 1972 graduate. And uh, they have sponsored, made a platform to engage artists across the world to make a way for international and magical connections. The Emergent Artist Space is a tool to transfer in lives and to give opportunities to those who may have limited opportunities to do so. This is the work of Vera Kano from India, and his work In Search of Home is about the uh, divide, the British rule divide in 1947 in uh, what is now India and Pakistan, and his family had to leave India and move to what is now Pakistan. He went back to his family home and did a series of photographs, which were very powerful, and made an artist book. And this is Jeda Bakchani, who had the reverse, went to India from Pakistan, and her work is called Interference, Where Do We Belong, and a series of drawings of wind, and quite beautiful book as well. The uh, third artist from the Emergent Artist Space, and as I said, I've, I've been on the board of this organization and I really feel close to Grazia, really wanted to represent these particular people. This is Sai, and Sai had his name uh, blanked out during the exhibition because he was in hiding. His father was a uh, politician in Myanmar, and um, of course, because of the coup, he was uh, in hiding. and. Sai also had to escape Myanmar. And uh, these are photographs of him uh, above here. This is a video that you're seeing. And this is him in his parents' house hiding. And he set up a time release camera right before he was able to escape. Sai is now in, uh, we got to meet him when we went to Venice for the symposium, and Jane was really lovely in consultation with Sai. He's now at NYU doing a graduate program, so he was um, a little safer. Uh, this is the work of Stephanie Gervais, who is a Reed grad from 2013, I believe, and she had a beautiful show at the Cooley Gallery not long ago. Stephanie lived in Calais, the um, refugee camp, and this is an interview with a man named Badar, who was, a, was kidnapped in South Sudan as a child. And she um, had him tell his story and following him through Europe. Um, it's all embroidered onto a blanket. So again, blankets being about comfort. And this is a photograph of Badar. Um, the last uh, artist that I'm going to show you here today, and then we'll turn it over to Jane for some comments, is uh, Lila Rue. Lila Rue is a, another graduate who lives in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, and she started a really amazing organization called New Roots, and it's a youth program centered around the empowerment. I'm just going to I'm, I'm just going to turn off the music for it, but uh, the empowerment of um, youth and uh, learning their own heritage, their cultural, ecological, and sustainable ability to live. Uh, Lila teaches these kids to make art. She also works with the indigenous population to teach them their uh, background. Um, it's a traditional whaling culture in St. Vincent's the Grenadines, and this is the school that she has started, and it's a nonprofit there. Uh, in addition to this amazing nonprofit, she's also um, made beautiful work with and for the kids. Uh, if we have some time at the end, I would love to show you more of uh, what Island, uh, 
what Lila is up to with new roots. Um, but I want to turn this over to Jane to give some comments because um, we had a lovely conversation at the symposium about the inner relationship between some of this work. Yes, thank you so much, Jerry, and thank you. It's lovely to see these works again. Um, it's also really great to be back to read on this occasion of the Alumni College, and thanks to Jerry for bringing us all together again um, around transitions and transformations. Um, the constant flux of our personal structures was a project that was as much a celebration of the Reed alumni as it was a triumph of Jerry's curatorial creativity. I mean, you can it's, off, it's so clear that this is just so much work went into this in, in terms of 15 artists, bringing 15 artists and um, through the, the, the media of book making as well as their individual media because it, it, you know many of, of the artists are, are working in film and photography and and weaving and craft uh, but to have a book and document it in a book form is a a, 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 a telling a form of communication in itself um, and I'm very much reminded of our early conversations about what it meant to present these artists that you selected in the grand space of the European Cultural Center's um, Palazzo Bembo in Venice. Um, I presume that was the name of that yeah, one yeah, because yeah. We, we gave our talk at Palazzo Michel. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this place was the impetus for bringing um, the works together, isn't, isn't that right, yeah, Jerry? Yeah. Um, this this idea that you could um, bring together overlapping representations of the biological, the environmental, and the sociological factors all in one show is very ambitious. The opportunity to showcase these powerful ideas come from the fact that they don't actually reflect the norm of the high art commercial art world. Um, it's history of which uh, Venice represents in a very epitome of artistic privilege and imperial class. If you think about uh, the way in which, um, you know, the Renaissance is the birthplace of high art. Um, and my own art, uh, my own work on, as an art historian researching global contemporary art and um, expressions of issues of race, gender, sexuality, and class, especially in the context of environmental crises lately, it has been also to trace these imperial and colonialist roots of global expositions. Um, it's only been recent, um, and I, I, I wrote an homage to uh, uh, Okwoi Inwazor, who was the first African um, curator of the Venice Biennale clear in 2015. Um, and up until then, it has been a very uh, particular rarefied space. Um, and because Transitions and Transformations was cited at the Biennale, it, was, it follows in this current innovation um, strategies adopted by curators like the Indonesian artist collective Ruin Grupa, the very first non-European collective to organize Documenta in Kassel, Germany, this very same time as the 2022 Venice Biennale. So the uh, sophisticated conception of Jerry's project, the first uh, 100 hours, a time period in which our DNA is first biologically created, I guess, <laughs> um, serves as the locus of Transitions and Transformations show, this event of the cell made poetic by uh, the art of Jerry, and her focus on the radiating links of the epigenetic nexus, in other words, the genetic and the epigenetic is literally the gene of the genealogy of all biological life, whereby environmental transitions of climate change are inextricable from human transformations of social and political impacts. That is to say, though, that altogether the 15 artists express the fragility and vulnerability of people in the context of the planet they reveal the inseparability of humans and non-humans in this time of transitions, planetary transitions. 
And um, the collaborative works uh, are really remarkable. If you think about how in the scope of, of these 15 artists, so many were parts of collectives and organizations, especially uh, Neely Yosha's Outside the Frame, Genevieve Trembley's, um, and Fernanda Oryuzon's Seikos, and Lila Roos's New Roots Emergent Art Space, each of them making art, working with communities. Um, when we first met with Neely, um, she described the magic that she witnessed uh, when the indigent youth community she works with made their films. And I'm so looking forward to Neely um, presenting that again for, for us. And film is all about that magic of capturing time and illusions of life, all the while documenting the real as a form of witness and evidence Homelessness has affected our young people. The gravity of its growing situation we all understand. Um, and um, ringing the bell was um, something that ne Neely presented in our very early conversations um, about um, bringing attention to the homelessness crises um, in Portland, Oregon, and um, in our discussions amongst ourselves, we, we really started getting into the concept of ringing the bell. It's a Buddhist concept on top of an alarming concept. Um, if you ever hear the bell rung in a spiritual meditation, it marks the unrepeatable moment. Since the bell is rung, it cannot be unrung. And so we can only live and experience the now that the only moment that you actually live is the now and with empathy toward crises. Buddhists see all of human life as one of suffering. Relief from suffering begins with the understanding that you really can experience yesterday or tomorrow and only now. So enlightenment is just that. Human suffering is caused mostly by what we think we don't have or a memory of loss or fear of the future of loss when in truth we can only live this very moment. Um, nothing expresses that better than film, photography, and capturing of moments in books. Um, and I'm reminded I was at giving a talk at NYU Abu Dhabi just a week ago. <laughs> or no, wait, it was more like four weeks ago. But it felt like a week ago. Um, <laughs> and I was reminded by someone in the audience who um, was another Reed alumni who said, uh, wow, um, your discussion of Chinese contemporary art, I remember as an alumni at Reed when Reed first had Chinese humanities. And I credit Chinese humanities for much of my thinking around Buddhist concepts and how that could be reflected in today's environmental crises. So with that, I think I'll hand the mic back over to Jerry yeah. and to, to give us a, a better look at what else is um, presented in the show. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. I love the way that Jane can tie these things together and um, the multiple crises and all of this affecting us simultaneously. Um, I want to turn things over to Neely um, Yosha, and uh, she'll give you an introduction to her films. This is a still from one of them. And, uh, and then Barb Tettenbaum will be speaking about her project, her book project. It's a trip to be on this side of Vaughan. <laughs> <laughs> and to see uh, old hippies. I'm talking about my mom here. <laughs> um, I'm going to speak briefly. I'm going to show you two films that total 10 minutes. Don't worry. Um, I came to read alone when I was 20 years old from Israel and spent two years here and really grew up at Reed. Um, the respect that 
students are shown and the care and the opportunities to explore. Um, it was love at first sight for me and made blind admissions for them. So it was a perfect match. <laughs> um, I did work study downtown. I babysat for the professors. I did a semester in Italy. I did marble carving in Colorado. Uh, when I ran out of money, the business office gave me an advance. When I decided to transfer out, uh, Lena Lenchek uh, helped me write my application and Stephanie Snyder um, gave me my, a job for the summer so I wouldn't starve. Uh, and those are just all that to say that they really see us and take care of us. It's not just about the, like the studying is beside the point. And that is the spirit that I try to bring to Outside the Frame, the nonprofit that I started. And if you haven't heard of Outside the Frame, that means you don't read the Reed College magazine and <laughs> shame on you. <laughs> um, outside the Frame, uh, trains homeless and marginalized youth to be the directors of their own films and their own lives, which is a fancy way of saying we work with young people uh, through filmmaking. Uh, we've been called an institution by Jane. I've quoted it in every grant <laughs> report since. Thank you so much. Um, institution. <laughs> really, we're a place currently at the top floor of uh, Union Station, the train station downtown, uh, a funky clubhouse uh, where homeless youth discover their own potential and share it with others through film. And filmmaking, like a liberal arts education, is uh, just a means, mostly, a uh, vehicle for self-discovery. Uh, but the, the medium itself allows for amplification and sharing. I don't think anyone would have heard of us if we were working in a different medium. Um, so they make movies about whatever's in their hearts and we help them get it out there. And then they can keep working with us uh, doing outreach, you know, there's, look on the website, there's lots of stuff they can do. And along the way and almost by accident, they pick up uh, real world skills. We now have a film workforce development program that we built because some of our participants caught the film bug and they're now making a living in the film industry. And really it's one of the only industries where a bunch of misfits can make an honest living. So it's a great way to, great path to send them on. The point is that if against all odds, these young people living on the streets can make movies, they can do anything. Um, and that's what Outside the Frame shows them. That's what Outside the Frame shows the public. That's what Outside the Frame shows the establishment. And what, thanks to Jerry, Outside the Frame has been able to show in you know, the finest uh, art establishments in the upper echelons uh, of society. And now we're gonna show them to you. Um, it was uh, a real honor to get to go to Venice my parents, as uh, she mentioned, uh, made the first anti-war film in Israel. They made the first films to go to Cannes for, to Cannes Film Festival for Israel. Many years later, the year before I came to read, we were, I piggybacked on, she was working on a film in France and I, she got me a job. And uh, the Cannes Film Festival was going on in the next town over. I said, mom, you're head of the department. Why don't you go see some premieres? And she said, if you're not there with your own work, it's not worth it. <laughs> so the same is true for the Venice Biennale, let me tell you. Um, she could have had the whole gallery to herself and she lifted up her students and uh, that's what it's all about and that's uh, the spirit that, that guides me. Um, anyway, we've made hundreds of films since we started short films. I'm gonna show you two of the five that were screened at the exhibit. One, The Giving Tree, was through a collaboration with Oregon State University. Uh, a professor of global studies managed to string together a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant. 
to combat social isolation among in the Latino community, meaning uh, combat homophobia. He wanted us to make uh, five educational telenovela style films that he could use as cur with the curriculum for middle schoolers. Uh, I said, okay, but we're gonna do it our way. Uh, we're not gonna produce telenovelas. They're gonna look even more ridiculous than the real ones. We're gonna <laughs> sit our par participants down, interview them, hear their stories, and then dramatize certain scenes from their actual life. We're not gonna make anything up. Their life is a telenovela. So that's the first one. The second one, uh, one of my first participants came to me needing a haircut. They had in the same week a funeral and a job interview to go to. So I took him to my hairdresser, <laughs> who I saw yesterday, and brought a camera just in case, and uh, therapy is uh, the result. Enjoy. Malcolm, please dim the lights and hit the button. I guess I discovered myself when I was six years old. So I know that I think I was not attracted to girls, that I was attracted to guys. And it's when I started discovering more about me. And when I turned seven, kind of like my family started figuring it out. They started telling me that it was a man. They say, oh, God make you a man so you cannot be a woman. My mom, she died when I was almost two years old. My dad, he died when I was four. So my dad brother, he take over me and his wife. She was the one who didn't accept me for who I was. So she started making my life miserable and she started like being mean, like putting me outside the house, letting me sleep outside, not giving me nothing to eat. And I was like, why are you being so mean to me? She's like, cause you're a man. You're a man, you need to act like a man. Act like a man. What you have to do is go to a place where you feel comfortable, sit down, talk to yourself and say, hey, are you sure you're this? You wanna be the other? For some reason, you know, you always want to come back to your family, no matter how bad they treat you. I was 16, and it was a Christmas Eve. So I came back, and I said, I have some plans for my life. I'm going to be a doctor. And they were like, they started laughing at me, like, well, you haven't been to school. And I said, because you haven't sent me. You're my own family. You never sent me to school. But I said, I'm smart enough. I taught myself how to read. And I said, but you know what? I said, for me to become a doctor, I'm going to go to America. They start laughing so bad. And I remember that I stand up so mad and I say, I will prove to you, not just to you, I will prove to myself that I can get what I want. I pack my stuff and I got a bus. And uh, as soon as I cross the border to Guatemala, I start crying. And I was like, what am I going to do? I'm like, people gonna discriminate me. People gonna treat me bad. I'm like, should I act like a boy or should I be who I wanna be? Keep walking, you can do it. And I passed through Guatemala, then I passed to Mexico. And then I came to, uh, to the border between Mexico and the United States with, it was like three months before my 18th birthday. I started walking the, the bridge. So I put myself on the line, I was walking and walking. And then when, they, uh, when I came to this police officer, he's like, oh, where's your passport? I'm like, my passport? <laughs> they say, what are you talking about? He's like, you don't have no passport? I'm like, no. 
It's like, where are you going? And say, oh, I'm just going to America. First off, I forgive you. I'm not mad. I love you. Thank you for holding on as long as you did. I know it wasn't easy. I don't want you to miss us or be sad or feel guilty anymore. Just be at peace. You deserve it. That's it. Are you nervous about your interview today? Uh, less nervous than I am about this. About the haircut? Yeah. Just because you haven't had one in a long time? Yeah. Well, I pissed the lady off, and so she messed up my hair really bad. <laughs> oh. What did you do? Uh, <laughs> she was telling me I had to respect my elders, and I told oh. her that respect needed to be earned. Oh. And then You're she messed up my hair. A little sassy. Yeah. I was 11. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and that wise. <laughs> I heard you lost your mom yeah. recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I mean, my mom was like a meth addict for my whole life and um, just was a slew of mental health issues and whatever. This wasn't, you know, the first time or whatever. Like, like a couple of months ago, like she did the same thing where she like barricaded the door and um, I had to go up there and like force my way into the room and like check on her every 15 minutes and make sure she was still breathing. And, 23 years and I finally was like, okay, no, I can't do this. And then she was like, okay, I'm gonna die. <laughs> like, yeah. So you have guilt around that? I think my body is made of guilt. I literally spent like my whole life like, like protecting my mom, yeah. you know? What am I supposed to do now that like, I don't have to take care of my mom. Yeah. Like, what do I do with myself? <laughs> but she was your mom. You know, you weren't supposed to be the one ca taking care of her. Yeah, no, I mean, I took care of myself and my sister and my mom, and it was fine. You know, like, how does someone, like, only take care of, like, themselves? That doesn't make sense to me. Why? Like, I feel like if it was, like, okay for, like, me to, like, take care of myself, then it also would have been okay for, like, someone to, like, take care of me as a child, which, like, never happened, which sounds really stupid, but, you know, whatever, that's life. I mean, I think, honestly, like, once I get over, like, all of the, like, the shittiness and the loss and the grief of it, like, I think I'll be relieved for her. Mm -hmm. like, I'm not relieved that she's dead, obviously. Like, she's right. my mom, but... Like, I am relieved that she's not in pain anymore. Yeah, like, her suffering has ended. Or... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I don't know, like, how long I'm, like, allowed to be, like, <laughs> um, sad about it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but emotions are stupid, so. Yeah. So are you, are you nervous about your interview today? I don't know. I mean, I hope I get this job. Um, I hope that it goes well and doesn't suck. I hope my mom's memorial doesn't suck. 
which it's going to. They were talking about like who's gonna speak, and I was like, I'll do it because I don't want anybody else to do it because they didn't like my mom and they you don't, don't protect her. Exactly, like no, like they don't they don't deserve to act like they cared. I hate it when people will be like, I'm sorry for your loss. Like mm-hmm. that phrase just like grates on my nerves. I'm sorry for your loss. <laughs> she's like not like tucked into the fucking couch cushions like <laughs> like a cheeto <laughs> yeah like you know yeah like, i don't know also i hate the phrase because it like implies that like i lost her which i didn't oh there's a good start good <laughs> job no we're gonna we're gonna move on <laughs> showing those beautiful films. So we're gonna go back to the PowerPoint and um, Barb Tettenbaum is going to talk about her project which connects really beautifully to Nellie's project. And uh, Barb, I'll hand, it over to, I'll hand it over to you. Would you like me to show the video of your book? Okay, so this is a still of Barb's book. And uh, we'll just start with the, the film will be going while you're yeah while speaking. I'm talking yes. you can hear me okay thanks um, yes I, I started this project in around 2016 so that's already seven years ago um, I was teaching uh, at the Oregon College of Art and Craft where I'd been for 25 years uh, and before I came to read and I my commute was down Burnside and then 405 up to North Portland and I started noticing, I mean, I always noticed um, people camped out in the bushes and the shrubs along 405 in different places. Things have changed a lot, obviously, in Portland. And those of you who haven't been to Portland in a while have probably noticed that. But back in 2016, there were these small hits of color of somebody's um, sleeping bag or somebody's tarp or something like that. And I started thinking about these people who were trying to live in Portland, who lived in Portland, who were, had this really liminal existence, um, this very peripheral existence, trying to find a space somewhere where they wouldn't be seen. That was just, I think, the idea is that you try to tuck yourself away. And I started to think about these people and their lives, and I wanted to um, just reflect on this. It was a very personal thing of just me figuring out kind of what, who these people were and, and what this lifestyle meant. And so I started just taking photographs from my car, not such a fun thing to do, pretty dangerous, but um, uh, just trying to capture these different little encampments that I was noticing and rendered them in the end in a, a process, a technique called pushoir, which is basically a fancy word for stenciling. It's a, a Japanese hand stenciling technique. I had done a project when I lived in the Czech Republic in 20, uh, sorry, 2003, uh, before they joined the EU. And they were still, the, the town I was living in was still kind of coming out of communism. It had been bombed quite a bit during World War II and all of the architecture and the different things that had been put in its place were this kind of Soviet era architecture and things. And so I had, wanted also to render that, that lifestyle as well. I don't have a copy of that book here, but I, in doing it in this pushoir technique, I realized that it was kind of elevating and bringing this delicacy to something that otherwise was maybe not so nice to look at. And um, it offered a place for people who didn't understand what was going on to kind of come in to something that otherwise might have been repellent to them. I mean, those of you who have been in and around homeless encampments since we all are now, I think, living with so much of this in our community, it's not something that's necessarily easy to walk by and want to talk about. 
But what I discovered in making this project and using this technique was that I could have conversations with all kinds of people because the book itself was so um, fragile and delicate and aesthetic, which is kind of an odd thing to bring to this. But I kind of believe in the power of aesthetics um, in opening up conversations. So like I said, I began this project in 2016 and documenting these, um, just these little moments of color. And um, fortunately, I have a friend who's here who has a friend who has been working with the homeless who has been collecting um, just different quotes that they found to be really interesting and kind of telling from these people that uh, they work with in a community up in Olympia, Washington. And um, some of the quotes for me were really uh, illuminating. It helped me understand things that I never thought about. Um, like one of them is, I think it says, I don't know exactly when it comes up here, but it's like um, having heroin is like having a hearth and home and in yourself mm -hmm. and the rent is cheaper, basically it says. Um, and then also saying things like, you know, if you're not on heroin when you are first homeless, you soon will be, you know, things basically along these lines. Just little phrases and so I started, I set them in hand set type, which is a very, you know, slow, you know, also con contemplative, precious um, kind of technique and hand printed them onto this very, very thin, delicate paper. So I wanted the images to show through each other and kind of create a community that necessarily wasn't there. You know, these people were living when I was documenting this in isolation, kind of in hiding. And so by putting them with transparent paper, it kind of brought this all together into one picture plane, as you can see. There's a few pages that you'll see going by that have these little dots. That is about a 10 mile radius from where I live, or maybe, maybe less than 10 miles, maybe just a few miles. And I was documenting on it, the, the Portland, um, Portland documents tents and vehicle encampments on a weekly basis. And you can go to a website that has this. You can actually scroll through it and see all of the dots grow and change and move. And I began to realize that a lot of the areas with which where th these encampments were were the same kind of places where the wild animals that live in Portland, the mm -hmm. coyotes and the, you know, the deer and things like that that also travel through our environment were also, in a sense, trying to live. And so, um, yeah, that's what mm -hmm. this uh, still is right now. As you can see, the there are two different colors of dots for tent encampments and then for um, RV and truck encampments. And there's a few dates on there as well because I took data from three or four different days out of a particular year. Um, I have the book here and invite you down to look at it. I'll turn the pages. But what I, in, in having this book, and I'll actually, if you can hold this for a second, I'll try to talk. I, I took this with me to a book fair that year. Um, but the, after the, I finished printing it, there's a, a big fancy book fair called the Codex Book Fair where people come from all over the world. And we show our books to collectors and other makers. And I realized that this was the first time I'd shown this book, and I realized that it had done exactly what I had kind of suspected and hoped it would do, which is that in talking to people and turning these pages, there were all kinds of people from all different walks of life who had experience in this growing you know, phenomenon of the homeless in their communities that I could have these conversations with across the table. And so it was something that I didn't really expect, but I was really gratified by. I think books obviously are ver normally very personal experiences, but I think the artist book is something that is kind of bridging this gap between the personal and the public. You know, they're made for public consumption. They can be exhibited in a, in a gallery setting. Mm -hmm. A video helps, the kind of phenomenon of video has really benefited the artist book. Um, but they really are something that you're meant to look at yourself. So people um, getting a chance to turn this and feel the lightness of the pages, kind of experience you know, the tactility of all the things in the book, I think kind of help bring them into this, I, what I hope is kind of a, a, almost like a sensibility of care 
We talk about mm -hmm. the, the body language of like, what is it, like the superwoman pose that's supposed <laughs> to bring like a certain rush of something into our bodies so we get the job. This I think brings um, a kind of a haptic memory of care and uh, fragility, which I hope lends to the book. Um, I do want to say a, a few words. So this book is now in the Reed College collection, and Jerry has um, has been my colleague since we both arrived in Portland. We both arrived pretty much the same mm -hmm. year around yeah, that yeah. time. Me um, in 1994 and Jerry in 1995, around there. And um, we've been 94. kind of comparing notes. Pardon? 93. 93. Mm -hmm. You before me. I didn't realize that. Anyway, um, but... Um, uh, the, the special collections at Reed College has been able to collect really amazing um, books. I mean, they bought everything for the show, right? Yeah, which so is everything gratifying. Went, into the, went into the collection, which yeah. is really a privilege. The <laughs> Cooley uh, family and the Gray family have really supported the arts at Reed, but this collection is one of the best in the entire West Coast. And the wonderful thing is that it's part of a college where students can go in and professors can go in and researchers and can access the work. And these projects don't exist in hiding. They become part of, their, their cultural voices are heard again. And so I think that's one of the things I just wanted to remind all of you are, of who have benefited from the collection, but also if you haven't had a chance to see the collection that Jerry has built, um, to come back and take some time and um, yeah. Thanks, Barb. I also wanted to just say that the reason I really wanted Millie and Barb to speak and Jane to speak today is that the first thing I started with is the Palazzo Bembao that the exhibition was in. That was somebody's home. Yeah. And Venice is the home of the high art world where extraordinarily expensive work gets bought and sold. It's not a place that people buy. It's a place that they go to see and then they buy things after the exhibition. So it's a really interesting setup. You're ac actually in the Venice Biennale, you're not allowed to sell, but people get the names of the artists that are in there, and then they go and buy the work from the galleries. So what Jane was re referencing as the Venice Biennale is being this hub of who's who in the art world. <laughs> Yeah, I thought I would kind of I thought I would kind of trump the whole thing and not do, you know, the staging but actually show work that's about real issues in the world today and particularly the homelessness issue um and uh, it's certainly an issue in the United States but um Italy has been the hub for many of the rafts coming mm -hmm. into Europe and Venice in particular so this was not just you know, an American problem. This is a worldwide problem. And uh, many people are leaving their homes because of environmental crises. And you know, the environmental crisis is also really impacting the way in which our environment is surviving, et cetera. So I, I just wanted to make that connection of why it was really important for me to show this work to all of you with these mm -hmm. wonderful, women <laughs> and their work. And I think Barb's is, you know, this really tiny, tender book that packs a punch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It, it's unexpected. I mean, I think that's, um, well, it's the power of books in general is that they, they enter that really close space and we read them and we read their images and we read their, you know, the, the turning of pages has its own read this idea of what you see and then what is revealed and then what is concealed, all of that, which is what filmmakers, of course, know as well, but yeah. um, the material part of it, all of that really comes together, and it's something that you don't really know until it's done. I mean, I'm teaching now here at Reed, which is um, so different from teaching where I used to teach, but I, what I love about the students here is that they're very motivated by their studies. You know, a lot of the students in my classes are not studio art majors, they're math majors, they're philosophy majors, a lot of environmental people come in, um, I think, to do kind of what, in a way, a lot of this work is. Yeah. And they find uh, a kind of a new voice in the book, they find a new voice in the materials and the space of this object that they've grown up with since they were children, but now they have kind of a certain, a new power over. Mm -hmm. 
So I just love that you yeah. created this library with this exhibition. And Bembo, do you know who Bembo was? He's one of the most important type designers. Right, right. Yes, sorry. Of course. So it wasn't of course. just And that was also <laughs> really important. It really important. <laughs> it wasn't anybody's house. Yes, it was a type <laughs> designer's house. Yeah. Yes. So also important. Yeah. Um, I want to open it up to questions or any other comments from uh, from you guys and, and from you. Um, but thank you all for attending. I understand we have a half an hour of questions, but if you need to leave, by all means. Yeah, yeah please. Yeah, so I am not the scholar, but the artist. So Shizuko Amai Takahaki, who I've worked with, is really the scholar of epigenetics uh, and a bioethicist. And the reason we were working on the book together is that the first 100 days is when your genetics is mapped, but also if you are exposed as a pregnant person to severe conditions, emotional, physical, conditions as well, pollutants, it's very severe for the unborn. So that's what we call an epigenetic factor, and it can cause the loss of children. Backing up a little bit, in 2018, I was part of the U.S. Embassy to Santiago, Chile, and we did a project looking at aquatic life. And what I learned there was the fish eggs are dying, the salmon eggs in particular in, in Oregon, Washington and California, because of the heat. So that's a perfect example of epigenetic factor. The eggs aren't surviving any longer because they can't spawn and live. That's why we have the salmon crisis we have right now. It's actually from the climate. So that's where climate, that's, that was a big wake up call for me. Climate and life, are completely connected and um, people are leaving their homes because of climate. So all three of these things really connected very, very deeply for me at that moment. So then being asked, and, and I've been working on projects, right? Um, knowing some of my former students working on these projects, like Ethan Raphael, who's been working with the climate, the wildfires, he isn't so much thinking about epigenetics, but when I saw his work, that's all I could think about was all of the wildfires in California causing all kinds of organisms to not survive or survive in, well, we've all seen the wildflowers this year, right? <laughs> that's also like this crazy phenomenon. So I am, I am an artist who follows the lead of scientists. I am not the researcher. Um, so often they ask me to work with them and, and I try to help serve in some ways. I, I, I do see myself as making art, but I also want to just put that out there. That you do the fun part. <laughs> I think they're, they're, they're having fun <laughs> in a different way. I don't know if they, I hope that helps, but. So it's part of this partnership. Yeah. Yeah. Trying, yeah. trying, always trying, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, please. This art is so important and it has so much social, cultural significance. It needs to be uh, seen, it needs a, a wide audience and diffusion in the culture. And I think of this beautiful book as an example, and I, I'm thinking there's one of there's, there's 30 of them, but okay. yeah, but it's still not, not that many. <laughs> The 
art world is so complicated. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have to say, this was really amazing to raise money for. And in the, there's a catalog up here you can all have. Um, I listed all of the organizations that helped sponsor this. So it wasn't a small task to get the money from all of these people <laughs> in order to do this, including the book itself. Um, really complicated. Uh, and something that really hit me hard was when I was trying to do this was the Ford Foundation. I'm a Ford fellow. They said that they would sponsor me in doing the exhibition, but they would not sponsor my students. So I had to really fight with them and well, not fight with them, but you know, wrote, write a lot of <laughs> appeals, get Friendly my smart letters. friends to help me write the grants because I'm also not a writer. Um, so yeah, this was really challenging. Uh, and, and I think that's the thing is that, um, yeah, museums haven't, you know, you this can work should be seen. Neely's work should be at the Portland Art Museum as well as theaters, right? Barb's work should be, um, yeah. We're also not, uh, there's a commercial part of this, right? <laughs> that if, if we had widgets to sell, maybe we would do a little better. You could watch all the films for free on Outside the Frame's website, yeah. outsidetheframe.org. Those films are, are hard to see, period. Yeah. Uh, especially uh, with the pandemic, the idea of going to a theater is still yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. How can I see your films? You can see them on our website. We also do a theatrical screening, like a gala showcase every year <clears throat> of our, you know, the best of what we've produced in the last year. This one's going to be. The Portland area. Yeah. What about you up in Portland? <laughs> yeah. The um, website. The website. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's some flyers up here too for you guys if anybody wants. Uh, for now, the website, you know. We'll Go ahead. Yeah. It was more of a discovery. I think I, I chose the very thin paper because I just, it, I, well, A, I really love it. <laughs> I was seduced by how it took to the printing process, this pushoir, and I think realizing, I mean, it's only really when you start to bind a book that you actually see what is happening in the book. I started realizing how the layers were interacting, and so, the, some of, sometimes these ideas come out of the things that you've already done. So this idea of that community, exactly what you said, kind of the community, this you know environment we live in, that you're sort of condensing that in some way, you're sort of squeezing that together and creating a single view, is something that I discover. And then that ends up feeding other projects. Like every project leads to another. Unlike I, I, the way I teach my students, I actually start with not knowing where I'm going. <laughs> I always tell my students to like have an idea and show me a dummy of what their project's going to be and I actually just launch myself into a lot of these things and start working and then let the process tell me what's happening. So yeah, so that's my answer. <laughs> Thank you. I want to let Neely respond to this, but Stephanie Gervais is a really great example. She did the piece Badar, that's the story of the man from South Sudan who was kidnapped. And she lived and worked with uh, a nonprofit feeding and clothing and housing that community for many years and ga 
gathered those stories. So she was part of another organization and an artist and got to know these people. So it wasn't, you know, <laughs> the outside coming in and just taking the stories down and not really being part of helping them survive. And um, Millie, I remember when we were talking about this before, um, you said something that was really amazing. Before you give them the cameras, you do need to make sure they have food in their mouths and boots on their feet. That's first. But if, can you talk a little bit about your working process? with this community? Just so for whoever didn't hear, how do you find, the question was how do you find the people that you work with and how do you make sure to work <coughs> with them in a way that's not exploitative, right? Um, at Outside the Frame, we recruit from the homeless uh, youth serving organizations in the area. Uh, we, because you have to have your basic needs met before you can make art. Uh, so they're recruited, it's voluntary. They choose to come, uh, they get paid to come to, to do the film projects. Uh, they call the shots, literally. They choose what movies get made and about what. They choose if they're in front of the camera or behind the camera. Um, they uh, have very highly developed bullshit sensors and <laughs> if they didn't trust us, they wouldn't work with us, you know? Um, so I think a lot of programs are prescriptive. You have to do this to get this. You want housing, you have to jump through these million hoops that are impossible and, and then get blamed for your own situation, right? Uh, here we're like, come in. Uh, out there is, you know, it, it might be difficult out there. Pe you, people might uh, not treat you well or you might be considered less than but not in here, uh, what do you got to say? Let's make some movies. Um, and don't waste this opportunity, right? It's a, like we said, it's a microphone, it's a megaphone, like make movies about stuff that's important to you and then they have at free, at, it's all free or they get paid and the, there's access to gear and mentorship and, and community so they can keep making stuff, not just through our classes, uh, experiment, you know, um, so voluntary and uh, creative freedom is, and snacks, good food is how we do it. <laughs> can, can I add something here? Um, I, are, are you working as an artist, by the way? Uh, no. No. <laughs> There's a real movement in the arts to, I have an MFA student that I'm supervising right now who um, is a community activist. I mean, that's her artwork. And she um, positions it and situates it as a, a performative, collective experience. And um, she literally is in Redlands. It was picked up in the Daily Beast the other day that she's in Redlands um, resisting the Proud Boys that have taken over this the, uh, the, the community uh, education um, boards. Um, in, in the local uh, schools. And so her work is literally as an artist is to create community activist platforms. And she says this is her performance art. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really effective because um, she really has changed things in her own community for her own children and her own um, you know, uh, neighborhood. And so I, I think there's many different ways through the arts these days to use performance, especially in environmental works, because a lot of environmentalists from the 1970s have been um, collectively performing environmental cleanups, restorations, mm -hmm. um, and they began in the 70s. Uh, Marilee Letterman Kelly's, um, uh, Betsy Damon, some of these artists have continued their work and expanded to take performance into environmental cleanups. So um, there's a lot of collective groups out there. One of the performative aspects of this whole, and I mean, the, the way that Barbara was talking about how she performs her work, 
um, the range of performances has has grown so that activism is is much um, more fluid mm -hmm. in in terms of, of what um, you could do in a community venue. So and I know we're in a bad time to take risks, right? But you just can't be afraid to. You can't be so afraid of offending somebody that you don't do anything. I mean, teaching, what right does somebody have to impose their ideas on somebody else? Decide that you're taking a stand and go for something, anything, you know? Don't be so chicken shit that you just like let the status quo happen. Um, and if you're doing it wrong, you'll be, you'll be informed real quick, you know? <laughs> real quick. It's okay. Are you saying the difference between art and propaganda, or Sorry. art? Are you saying art and versus propaganda, or uh, art versus changing the world? We all just do the best we can. I don't care about what art versus changing the world <laughs> means. I mean, why should why should the art be different? Correct. How can art change? I, I think the way I heard your question was is maybe answered by saying that some people whisper and some people. Yell and you know, or something in between, and there's all of that. And I think you can sometimes communicate really best by whispering to certain people, and and you're not going to get as many people in your radar, but you're still gonna you're gonna actually hit somebody right where they need to be, and w and the world is changed by individuals, you know, just one at a time. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, I mean, so I think it, it all the breadth of it has its own place, its effect, sometimes something really quiet. If it was only one of a kind, yeah, it would be sad and hard to even have it here today. I'd be all precious about it. But um, but things, you know, is if, if, they, if you get under people's, you know, their whatever they do to keep the world out, if you can sneak in that, you know, sort of, uh, that what is the horse, uh, the Trojan horse, they say the book is the Trojan horse of art you can actually affect more hearts and minds. It, it really depends if somebody's looking at my work, um, what their life experience might be. So I've worked with a bioethicist and that those images, you might see them in a textbook, but rarely would you see them in a museum. It's, it's literally a child. It's in vitro fertilization and that was a human being that was born and I document that as well. So if you read the text and you realize that you're looking at the egg, of a real human being developing, I think if you take the time to look at that, you might realize. And every one of the pages, it's a 100 page book, it's 100 hours of film that we laboriously made, <laughs> which was very hard. Um, right now, we're facing a crisis in reproduction, both uh, in vitro and abortion will be contested in the next two years, particularly in vitro because that's a lot of babies that the anti-abortionists are looking at. So I was very aware that I was making something quiet, but very political uh, for people to see and putting it in an in international stage, you know, for sure. Um, but, and I've worked with a lot of really, uh, if you look at my website, I've worked with a lot of really contested issues. I've worked deep, did a deep dive into eugenics in biometric data, um, basically documenting Geipel, who took all of the handprints of all people in Germany, including Jews, to prove that they were uh, malformed <laughs> and, uh, of course, not mentally able to be part of this world. 
and eliminated them. That work also quite tender, quite beautiful. But if you know what I'm, who I'm referencing, what I'm doing, you might get it. Um, yeah, I guess you know I'm really not interested in making the poster, <laughs> though I could, because I know the information. Uh, but um, yeah, if you take the time, that work is pretty political, particularly right now. And as I was making that work, um, abortion has been contested over and over again. Um, so yeah, uh, um, it, it is tricky, you know, how you, how one decides to make their work and who's the audience and yeah. But it also raises the question what we consider as art today, mm -hmm. you know, and, and how art has expanded to be, its, its median is conceptualism because bottom line is the concept that you're trying to portray and aesthetics is always a part of it or not. But when it's not, it's still a part of it. So um, I, I think that those definitions have expanded. Um, the but if you want anyone to watch it, you better make it aesthetically it, pleasing. And if you want anyone to watch it, you better make it aesthetically yeah. jarring, pleasing, moving, however it does to your emotion. But it work performs and conceptualizes today. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really great because it used to be only aesthetic, I think. You know, more so in the modern era, but more, more so mm -hmm. and, and but perhaps. But we make work to save ourselves. If anybody else is affected by it, that's a bonus, you know? <laughs> yeah, I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that that's also a really beautiful piece to mention because each one of the artists have been making work from their own personal life experiences. Yeah. It's not just random, right? <laughs> so that's... Um, anybody else have any other questions? Oh, great. Yes. I have read the book, and my brother-in-law, who is a geophysicist, gave it to me. <laughs> and I had been going on a lot of hikes with him over the years, and he would be telling me the geology, and you know, see, this is art. And then he would like stay over and do math problems and leave the papers all around him. Like, w w Tony, what are these math problems? Is this is my art? <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> you know, he's figuring something out. So. So I just, I love that, I love that. And, and it really did, that moment really changed the world. There's also a really beautiful book, Art, Science, and Spirituality, that came out a few years ago um, that is showing some contemporary artists who are working at the intersection of art and science. Um, so really, some, uh, some interesting things going on uh, in that regard. Actually, you know, I'm speaking from a sympathetic point of view. You know, this is something that reminds me of what happened Yeah, I think that's a really good point too because like Barb's work, she's using the polysemiotic, the physical, the kinesthetic to tap into our emotional state, right? So art can really do that beyond, you know, just telling us right <laughs> what I we already ten thousand. I saw yeah. some tears. Um, what gets me out of bed in the morning is that old Jewish adage that it's not for you to complete the task of repairing the world, but neither may you desist from it. Mm -hmm. Do your best. <laughs> but I do know from my days as an activist that you don't change anybody's mind through facts and figures, <laughs> just from the heart. Yeah. Well, thank you all for coming and staying and listening. Thank you. And if anyone wants to come down, uh, I can yes. turn some pages for you as well. And also, we have some little catalogs that were left over from the show, if anybody wants one. Um, and Stephanie Gervais also made a really beautiful book of um, writing and poetry. 
uh, about her work with the residents at Calais in France. <laughs> 